Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings, James 1.1. 1, 1. And James begins his letter with the usual start of greeting. In fact, the word greetings in the New King James, which is in the singular in King James, is the Greek word karou, C-H-A-I-R-O with a line over the O. And it generally means rejoice or be glad. And as a greeting, it's a simple salutation, which literally expresses a wish that whoever is being greeted would experience joy. Now, what, what, what struck me as I was reading it just now, and apparently I did a mime version of this because my mic wasn't on yet, but um, if you call me on the phone, that's how I answer the phone, greetings. You know, so, so I had no idea I was wishing people um, an experience of joy. So hopefully all our conversations will be that way. Probably won't, but uh, hopefully they will. And just using it is reminiscent of what Jesus said in Matthew five twelve. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven but they so persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's Matthew 5, 11 and 12. The word rejoice in Matthew 5 is the same Greek word used by James in his greeting. I wonder how many of those who read this letter or received it, read that first line and realized that the topic in the next two verses would be persecution just like it was when Jesus spoke it to the Sermon on the Mount. Now remember, we talked about this, and I don't know if you saw the, um, the foundation or the, the first two sessions of this study uh, where we did a background, but James is writing to Jewish Christians who have been uh, spread out all over the known world at the time because of the Jewish persecution in Jerusalem. So they're leaving behind, basically, the wisdom brain trust of infant Christianity. And they're going out to all these different places, and they're leaving under bad circumstances. So a greeting like this, he says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, um, and then he says, I hope you experience joy. Look at how this influential elder in the church, and by church I mean born again people, of the born again people, the church, which was in Jerusalem, describes himself. See how he describes himself. He doesn't give a list of credentials or titles, none of which had yet been added to the purity of the church Jesus uh, instituted. James refers to himself as a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're gonna we're gonna read you know as we go on and do other letters, God willing, um, uh, we're gonna see Paul does this all the time, and and these people understood, they understood where they stood with the Lord Jesus Christ, and they understood that they weren't elevated personalities. The word translated as bondservant is the Greek word doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S. According to the Complete Word Study Dictionary, one of my favorite resources, uh, because it's written by a guy named Spiro Zodiades, and if that man doesn't understand the Greek, nobody does. I mean, he's, 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 if you ever want to spend some good cash, buy his Complete Word Study Dictionary in the Greek. It's... You know, it's this thick, it's a big book, and it's worth every penny. It has every use of every Greek word in the, in the Bible, and it has all broken down by modifying words around it in context. It's an excellent resource. I've given it to two other ministers, neither of which I think ever opened them up. Uh, because I thought they were good, I thought they were good um, resources. So according to that, this word bondservant means a slave 
one who is in a permanent relation of servitude to another, his will being altogether consumed in the will of the other. In other words, whatever, whatever the one I serve wants, that's what I want. That's how a bond servant approaches the world. This could be a matter of voluntary or involuntary servitude. In this case, of course, it's fully voluntary since James became a Christian like everybody else did or has through voluntarily asking Jesus to purchase him. Romans 10. Confessing Jesus as my Lord, my owner. Hi, David Geiger. It's good to see you there. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings, James 1.1. 1, 1. Even today, there are many who do not believe that Jesus is God, and sometimes they use verses like this to prove their point. And this is how their logic goes. So I believe that when you teach a book of the Bible, uh, you can do like my brother Charlie does, um, which I love, and I'm, I'm actually just give a little plug He's, he's on a, um, a Christian radio show that actually broadcasts out of Bowie, Texas. And, and has invited me to be on there next Sunday night from 6.30 to 7.30 um, Central Time. And I'm going to post that uh, when I get near. And, and you can go to, let me see what that link is. You can download an app for it. The Upper Room Christian Radio show or I upper room christian radio dot com oops excuse me i spent most of my life oops trying not to relive the accidentally started up but the upper room christian radio um upper room christian radio dot com i think it is anyway i uh, mostly what he does is he, he shows great respect to the scriptures by just reading the scriptures and and that's how most of his bible study does with minimal comments in between. Now, I obviously have a little different style, but I, I listened to, to Charlie last night, and it was just awesome on the radio, and and um, just the purity of it, not trying to not trying to make himself into anything. I love that. When I when I do it, though, because of, of this is what I think the Lord has me do, when I teach, I want to do as broad a, a the biggest net as I can for every single thing that we run across because it's not just equipping us about James, it's equipping us about Christendom. It's, it's equipping us in, in, in to how, how we interact with one another and how we are as a church and giftings and how we interact with the world and, and all of it, right? So I want to do that. And you're going to run into people, and there's a couple of cults running around out there, pretty active cults, that believe that Jesus is not God, and you're going to run into them. And and uh, this is their logic with a verse like this. A bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The logic is that if Jesus was God, why didn't James say either God or the Lord Jesus Christ? Which on the surface sounds like good earthly logic until you dig into the word a little bit. So a little bit of equipping on this issue. First off, in order to distinguish the real God from all the man-made or demonic gods, quote, unquote, by referring to our God with a capital G, in the Hebrew as Elohim, it's plural. They would... Um, They would, they would use Elohim. Now, Elohim in itself, in the Hebrew, is a plural. And this fits with what we know about what many call the Trinity, which I don't believe as a term is in the Scripture whatsoever, but the, the idea is in the Scripture, and the, and the term Trinity is, is a way to describe something that's really hard to wrap our heads around. So it, it does fit with what we call the Trinity, a triune God, which first becomes evident in Genesis 1, in verse 26, where the Lord says, God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, all these plural pronouns. 
when the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew to Greek in what is now known as the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, the word Elohim was translated to the Greek word Theos, T-H-E-O-S, which is singular rather than Theoi, T-H-E-O-I, which is plural and would cause people of the day to become confused and equate the real God to be similar to the man-made ones and there were multitudes of gods. Does that make sense? So when they translated, I did, I did some, I'm doing a lot of, this is slow writing because I want to do a good job and I want to go deep and I want to really look at what James is saying that the readers, Hebrew Christians, Jewish Christians would understand. And, and so that when he says something, we're hearing closer, I hope, to what they were hearing. Um, when James says that he's a bondservant of God, of Theos, he is referring to God the Father and is considering that his Jewish Christian brothers and sisters approach God with that term their whole lives. In a sense, he's telling them, I know exactly how you feel about this. Just by using the term and right off the hop in the very first line he's, he's connecting with his readers. However he isn't speaking to people who simply have a shared heritage as Jews. These people are like him. Jews who have received Jesus for their salvation. They're born again. It's also important for them to hear that James, hear James say that he is a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the idea that Jesus is God becomes more and more natural for them to consider. They're in a, pl they're in a place of transition spiritually from a lot of old ways, from hundreds of years of doing things a certain way and then being passed on to them. And he's, he's helping them out by, by addressing both. I address your Jewishness heritage with the word theos, and I address the fact that you have a new heritage as Jewish Christians by referring to Jesus Christ. James, a bondservant of God. If, if I'm not communicating this clearly, let me know, because it's a strange concept. But, but it's because I'm not a Jewish Christian. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, Gentile born and raised. Um, heathen born and raised. And so, so I, I don't look at it from a Jewish standpoint. You have, to, you have to make yourself do it in order to get behind the eyes of the writers and the people reading it in the first century. James, the bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Now, using the word scattered would touch the heart. Hey, Dallas. Hey, JW. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Donna. It's good to see you all. Um, using the word scattered when he says to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, James 1.1, 1, 1, it's going to touch the heart of Jewish people. That word is the Greek word diaspora, D-I-A-S-P-O-R-A. And being scattered like they have been, as Jewish Christians due to persecution is something Jews had experienced many times and, and, and still do today in some places. How it must have caused James's heart to ache to have to use that word to describe what had happened to his brothers in Christ, these Jewish Christians. This time though, the scattering was being used by the Lord to spread his kingdom. I mean, think, think about it. And I don't know if I'm going to get into this. So, you know, Satan, Satan works it out so that Jesus gets executed after being humiliated. Jesus ruins all those plans for rising from the dead. Uh, he, then he makes it worse for Satan. And he, he, he places himself from Pentecost into, through the Holy Spirit, 
every single one in an experiential way of those Christians. So now Satan's problem is multiplied many times by a bunch of spirit-filled Christians running around Jerusalem. So Satan now puts his boot down again. I'm going to crush this, get the Jewish leaders to do their thing, lie, cheat, murder, persecute, kill, steal, destroy all satanic stuff. And they spread. And now Satan's problem is much worse. And God is basically using the persecution to expand his kingdom. He starts again, remember, greetings. He ends his sentence with the word greetings, or rejoice, or be glad, or I hope this brings you joy. You know, we're in a rough season in history. Uh, there's a friend of mine's father passed just today. Um, everybody has moments or, or even seasons of crisis. Some people seem to have lifetimes of crisis. And the next few sentences might seem small and simple to just read in the English. But as we dig into them, we're going to see that James is equipping his readers, and that includes us, on how to handle situations that, may, that take a great toll on us and might even seem hopeless. He's equipping us, which is one of the things that, that pastors, evangelists, prophets, teachers, and, and, and apostles are to do is to equip the brethren. So he's equipping, right? Underlying this man's teaching, underlying James's teaching is this constant awareness that he does not belong to himself, that he belongs to God, and that faith, utter reliance on him, and we're going to go into that deeper later, and nothing or no one else, utter reliance on God and nothing or no one else is the key to riding out the crises life brings and to do that victoriously. So let's pay attention to what he teaches us. Let's pay attention to it. Let's 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 make a decision that gone are the days when we sit through a Bible teaching or a sermon and have have an emotional experience and then we move on and let life kick us in the teeth and then we go get a little booster shot here and there. Let's take every single thing that we learn as if it really is from God and really is equipping us for what he knows is coming next in our life and the lives around us so we, we know how to operate, so we know how to be the kingdom on the earth. So let's pay close attention to what he teaches us and let's resolve to practice these things to the point of them, make, them becoming our lifestyle. And this is what Paul teaches us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. The things which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. Practice these things, one version says, and the God of peace will be with you. It won't benefit us in the least to read this or listen to this and it not become a part of us and a part of how we approach the world. So let's resolve. Let's resolve deep inside ourselves. I'm going to receive this, and I'm going to do it. James 1, verses 2 and 3. So we're moving on to the next two verses. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And as we go through the study, I don't know if I'll get to it this week, but we're going to challenge what a lot of people do with that as superstition. Now, we're not challenging those scriptures as superstition. That's the word of God. That's not superstition. That's scripture. That's from God. Um, you know, Paul says all scripture is God-breathed, and so I'm not ever going to call that or think of it as superstition. But what people do with some of these ideas in the body of Christ is 
And some of us have done these things, and let's just throw that by the wayside. The first thing James does in this sentence is to affirm those receiving this letters as his brethren. And this is very important for people, especially people having troubles. Some of, of whom have or will witness the loss of blood kin due to the scattering of words to persecution by death. So it's real important in times like this that we, that we acknowledge our shared heritage in Christ, my brethren. Now there, now there are many who are desperate to have relatives redefine pretty much anyone who's nice to them as being family. Some try to market their Christian organization as church families, and which is nice, and it sounds nice, and it's heartwarming and everything, but it's a concept which is an invention of Western Christendom in which unwittingly minimizes the truth that all Christians are one family no matter where or even how they gather. We, we tend to gather in house churches, although I do I worship last Sunday in our local church. I went, Laurie and I went, and I got prayer for a medical condition that I have. But we, we worship in, the, in the, uh, the house church stuff. We, I find that, in my mind, to be most like most, most near what I see in the scriptures. But it really doesn't matter. That's not my church. It happens to be the house we pay a house note on. <laughs> but I don't consider it to be my church. And the people that come don't see it as their church. They see it as being with each other. The Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, put it like this. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. We belong to an immense family. Recently, I, I might have said this, I, I talked to a young guy on the phone. I really don't know how old he is. His father-in-law is a pastor of a church in India. And um, relatives are trying to make, force him, his hand, to sell a church land so they can divide up and get their cash. And they don't really seem to care um, what good is happening through Jesus Christ in that place. And, and what I told them when we were done was, and I might never meet him. I might because he lives in Houston and I go there at times. But I told him, it's, I just love meeting other family members in the body of Christ, even if it's over the phone. We have an immense family. When you hear about Christians being persecuted in Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever it is, Egypt or wherever they're, they're hurting our brothers and sisters today, that's us. They're hurting us and we're connected to them. Hey Tina, and that's one of the reasons we should be praying for them because they're us. They're us. We, we at one time when I was a new Christian, fairly new, a few years old, and I was about to get my degree in counseling, my master's, and um, the, the congregation that we were with in the Houston area um, had a five-year plan to start a second congregation of the same split from the rest of Christianity. Um, you know, their denomination in, in the same town. And it never happened. And and um, and I asked a, a leader's wife one day about it, and she goes, well, how will we control those people? And her, her issue was control. What I keyed on was I looked at her and I said, well, those people are us. Uh, in, her, in her mind, if when we left that building and we went to another building, we no longer were a part of her. But our king disagrees. And that's what I told her. She goes, they're not us. To this day, I mean, that's a long time. I feel, I still feel sad thinking about that. They're not us. I guess the blood of Christ grows thin. <laughs> if you don't worship in my, in my way or in my building or 
what you know us in charge or whatever I don't know I just don't I don't I don't want to be able to understand that um, but the truth is that all Christians are one sometimes Christian logic can seem so bewilderingly different from worldly logic in the world we need these worldly alliances we need earthly alliances but in Christ well in Christ Jesus is enough to James and to Jesus all Christians belong to one spiritual family regardless of their earthly heritage or earthly family of origin a race color and all that stuff one family James 1 2 to 3 says my brethren count it all joy my brethren count it all joy again he's writing this to fellow Jewish Christians who have been scattered all over the known world for one reason because they follow our Jesus they need these scattered Christians need to hear about their kinship with this man James in Jerusalem they're undergoing trials why else would they be scattered there's a couple that went through some trials and uh, the, the guy has some some kind of um, organic problem in the brain and and because of it he was in the hospital a lot and one day I was in Fort Worth and I just showed up and I don't worship I don't, I don't even know where to worship you know I don't care but they the friends of friends and but they're born again and we've gotten a little bit closer and we see each other from time to time but I sat you know with the wife while the doctor was in there doing doctor stuff and she was like uh, why are you here I mean you're, you're not even a part of our church and I said well you're my sister well, what do you want to do I just want to be here I really have anything to say I didn't want to recruit her for my organization or any kind of stuff like that just she needed someone to be with her these are people under crisis like they were they needed someone I just stayed there until it looked like she was uh, okay you know I had the time and I had the gas money and so it was just good they're undergoing trials they're scattered they're not they're not in their home anymore they're wherever they are so here they are in this rough time and what does what does James say count it all joy when you fall into various trials you know like the ones you're in now James begins just two verses into the letter addressing the need he considers to be most crucial for the scattered Jewish Christians and that issue is trials the King James translates that word to temptations I'm not quite sure it's an accurate translation of that Greek word the Greek word is pierasmos and it means a state of trial in which God brings his people through adversity and affliction in order to encourage and prove their faith and confidence in him not prove like they're making a case to a judge refine their faith that comes out of the complete word study dictionary in the modern church the word temptations has to do with demons carrying bad ideas from Satan to cause us to sin and in truth the word pure pure osmos has more to do with difficult situations which arise in our lives that wasn't talking about temptations to sin these are things that include stuff like sickness poverty bereavement disappointment persecution etc anybody in here have any of those you have any disappointments you have any of those I was talking to Jennifer hi Jennifer earlier about about how how um some medical news that got a couple of weeks ago just felt like just like it just a series of defeats i needed some i needed some encouragement you know i didn't i didn't need somebody telling me oh it could get worse you know or you know but he's saying count it all joy i find it interesting that james says that we fall when 
Count it out joy when you fall into various trials. You know, if you've fallen, ever fallen, and uh, we had ice everywhere here last week, so everybody was falling down. Um, nobody, nobody ever seems to plan to fall. Whether it be to slip and fall down or to, um, to have a moral fall or a spiritual fall, it just sort of catches us off guard. The word fall describes stumbling into something which then seems to completely surround us. So it, tri it trips us up and then it's like it's all around us, you know? If you've ever found yourself in any kind of crisis, you know exactly how that feels. My brother, encounter all joy when you fall into various trials. James says we're to count it all joy when this happens to us, which is the exact opposite of how we usually process a crisis. The Amplified Bible renders that phrase like this. Consider it holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy joyful. Yippee! I'm in a trial. I'm in a crisis. How can we possibly do this? Well, James is teaching us to decide how will we respond to a crisis before we fall into a crisis. This is prep. This causes us to engage our mind and our chooser, our will, and make our emotions follow them instead of reacting to the crisis or to whoever initiates the crisis. You know, we don't realize, if you think about it, or if you've been in a place like I've been doing what I'm doing in ministry, uh, I've seen lots of crises and I've seen, seen lots of done lots of equipping for this and I've had my own you know I mean I've been I've been breathing a while look look at the white hair um, we don't realize there's a general there's a there's a genuine power exchange when we allow a crisis to take control of us we hand over the power of our soul to an illness or to an IRS agent or to a pandemic to fear instead of retaining that influence, or better still, taking that influence and handing it off to Jesus, who owns us, because he purchased us with his blood. <clears throat> Reactions always give power to whatever it is to which we're reacting. If you push me and I push you because you push me, you're in control of me because you set the tone, and I'm obeying you by pushing you back. So we don't want to react. We want to respond. We want to think ahead of time, have a game plan, be able to do something. And James, James is recommending that we choose ahead of time to count it all joy. And his logic behind that is to explain what happens inside us if we allow the Lord to walk us through the crisis. But what are most of us doing at times of crisis? Help, 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 take us out of the crisis. And I know there's a psalm in which it says, I cried out to the Lord and he reached me and climbed down to me and he lifted me up and took me out of the miry clay. He does that. He rescues. In fact, that's, I believe that's what the word Christ means, rescuer. But we have an opportunity in every crisis to be a part of our own spiritual growth. That's why you can count it all joy. Well, and before we lose sight of this tiny but important word, James doesn't say if you fall into various trials. He says when it happens. When you fall into various trials. In other words, stuff will happen. Life isn't all rainbows and unicorns, and that's because when Adam handed off his authority to the devil, Genesis chapter 3, all of humankind from that point on was plunged into a spiritual war. Satan loves to kill, steal, and destroy. 
John 10:10, 10, 10. and all of that looks well, like various trials. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Get used to the idea. Let's take James's lead and handle it the way we're designed in Christ to handle crises. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, produces uh, patience, I'm sorry, patience. James wants us to approach these trials mindfully. That's why he uses the word knowing in that sentence. He wants us to be aware of a process which happens inside the human soul if we do not let the crisis control our emotions. What is the process? James says the testing of your faith produces patience. And you know, if all we can anticipate is dire circumstances when a crisis looms before us, the dire circumstances is all we're going to see. I'm going to repeat that, and that's probably going to be in my... Um, takeaways from this when I post it on Facebook later. If all, when a crisis happens, <clears throat> if all we can anticipate in dire circumstances, when a crisis looms before us, the dire circumstances are all we can see. Anything else God is doing will elude us. Some of y'all know I'm in a, I'm having a this, this is just me being thirsty. A little bit of a medical crisis. <clears throat> Actually, uh, things are turning around in, in that. My blood sugar is looking better. Hopefully that'll, that'll make my kidneys work better. And I'm looking at the possibility of dialysis. And, um, and I, I don't want it. And that, to me, is my crisis right now. That's a big, a big uh, loss in my mind and, and that, you know there's certain things that you look at and you think well I lost that battle and I don't want to lose this sometime in the future it'll be time for me to go to the by and by but I don't think it's time but I, I really I, I value the time that I get to spend doing what I do writing and all that and I don't want to spend it doing that yet I'm going in on Wednesday to get the prep work for dialysis and, and that's in case I need it so that if I do, they don't put some kind of tube in my neck to do it. I'd rather have it in one of my arms. And so we're going to do that. At the same time, it's looming. You know what I mean? I mean, I wake up in the middle of the night, and that's what I'm thinking about. So how do you handle that? And you might have something much worse going on than that. But, but just as an example, because it's fresh and I'm experiencing it right now, how do I handle that? I think about something else, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like ignoring it. It's still there. It's real. I'm not in denial. I'm not playing mental games with it. I just don't want that idea in control of this. This soul belongs to Jesus. It doesn't belong to possible dialysis. And so that's what I'm doing. That's, and it's exactly, that's what I was thinking about when I wrote this. If all we can anticipate is dire circumstances when a crisis looms before us, the dire circumstances are all we will be able to see. Anything else God is doing will elude us. So God could be doing all kinds of stuff in the background, and if I get obsessed with that, I won't even pick up on it. I won't see it. I won't hear it. And that means that I'm not getting all the truth. I'm just narrowing it down to what I'm afraid of or what I'm dreading, right? So I don't want to do that. If we're aware, though, that bad things happen, they might happen, very bad and very real things, but that God is going to make sure we don't, that that is not wasted in our lives. Rather, we'll use it, we'll utilize it to refine our souls. Then we can be somewhat comforted with that truth. It's like the spiritual jujitsu move where Satan throws something at us and God takes it, uses this momentum to accomplish something good in our souls. Ha ha! Satan, 
You know, that's not going to work. It's not going to control me. I'm trying to learn to practice something. This is what I'm practicing, and maybe you can too. When I sense something is that is about to happen, and I sense it's going to be bad, and you know that moment when you go, perk, this is going to be bad. You know, I speak to the Lord, and I say something like this, and this is not a canned prayer. You do your own version. But, but I'll think something like this. Lord? And I'll probably have that tone. Lord? I'm probably not going to enjoy this, but I know you. And I know you love me and will make something good happen because of it. It always helps me to calm down and to begin to watch out for whatever he's up to. And I and the people I disciple and the ones who received me have a saying based on this idea, God is always up to something. And it's an idea that Paul spoke to the Christians in Philippi in Philippians 1 6. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Will complete it. That means it's an action, an ongoing action. He's busy up to something. We are his own possession. When Satan or someone doing his bidding or a calamity or natural disaster hits, God always and forever has known it was coming. He's going to use it for his glory. Sometimes it's hard for me to understand how a death or destruction will translate to that. I simply trust him to know and to do what's best. And with that, we're going to close for this week. That'll be the end of tonight's study for this week. That's where we're going to uh, end it. Um, we're going to pray. I want to uh, thank you for being here. It means it means a lot to me that people spend their time being a part of this. And thank you to those who said you were here, so I knew you were here. Um, today is one of those days, you know, I'm not much on special days personally, um, but my calendar is. And my calendar says that 30 years today, about Two hours ago, 30 years ago today, was a Friday in Houston. I, um, I resigned from Amico Production Company and went into, quote, full-time ministry. In my brain, I was in full-time ministry. Uh, I personally believe now that every Christian has been in full-time ministry ever since. But I am a bit more vulnerable to the Lord's provision now it seems, than it felt like I was back then. No more matching fund savings, no more four weeks paid vacation, no more free insurance, no more of that stuff, no more overtime, no more of that. Um, every day we go to the mailbox to find out how God has touched someone's heart to give to what we do so we can keep doing what we do. Uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, uh, Joe, is Ukraine the part of Russia that you're originally from? Uh, right now, Russia is gearing up to um, to invade uh, Ukraine and um, subjugate it. Uh, hopefully, it won't happen. Hopefully, nobody will get hurt. Um, but that's what's happening. Um, so let's pray. Joe, tell me if that's where he's originally from. So, Father, we, we, uh, we lift this study up to you and ourselves up to you to do it as you see fit. I thank you for prompting James to write this letter to have, have the... Um, he's not... Joe is from Penza, Russia. Um, Lord, we thank you for, for having James had the sensitivity to reach out to his brothers and sisters in Christ in various parts of the known world at the time and for making sure that the letters uh, exist for us today. I ask you to teach us. We're going to uh, we're gonna try to ring out in your name. Um, I want, well, I'm hoping you ring out through the teaching every bit of information, every bit of revelation, every bit of equipping that we can get out of the short letter. I thank you for people who care about your word so that you um, 
so you can be glorified. And I ask you to bless us, Father. Those who are ill, we ask you to heal them, um, including uh, talking to my kidneys. Um, and also um, all those who are grieving, like my friend whose father uh, passed today and uh, my friend Gary here, whose good friend passed away last week. I ask you to bless them in their grief. Father, I ask you to always protect us from the bondage of only remembering um, people that we love in terms of how they died. I ask you to remind us all the good things, the whole life, and not the end of the life. And I ask you to bless us. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, I know it does, Joe. I love you. Um, I hope I get to spend some time with you soon. Anyway, uh, God bless you guys. Um, I cooked our supper last night, so 